there's, there's a whole keep reading principle. I have here John 6, 44, Ephesians 1, 4, Romans 9, 18, and John 17, 9. Why do people believe in Calvinism? It's an inability, it's basically an inability to keep reading. People read John 6, 44, and they don't keep reading to John 6, 7, 39, and John 12, 32. All right, we'll talk more about John 6, 44 in a couple of minutes. But if you, if you follow Pink and you read a bunch of what Calvinists say, they always presume, a lot of people say the Holy Spirit has to draw you. Well, there's no passage that ever says the Holy Spirit ever draws anybody. And the closest anybody can come is over in Revelation where it says the Spirit and the Bride say come. Okay? Well, there's no passage that says the Holy Spirit does any drawing, specifically the word draw. El Kuo. Okay? It's not there. In John 7, 39, if you notice, you may not notice this if you're a Calvinist, but you... In John 7, 39, that's chapter 7. What that means is that comes after chapter 6, because the number 6 comes before chapter 7. By the time chapter 7 gets here, which is after chapter 6, the Holy Ghost still not yet given. And if you look at chapters 14 through 16, all about the Holy Ghost still to be given in the future. Okay? Not there yet. Not there yet. Still operating in, in, a, in an old, in a old Testament sense. So the Holy Ghost is not yet given, which means it's not the Holy Ghost doing the drawing. And if we find out, I mean, don't you think that maybe the cross is kind of an important event? When you look at a timeline, you see all the different things that happen in the New Testament. See this little thing right here? Do you realize that the uh, John chapter 6, verse 44, all of John chapter 6 takes place before the cross? Don't you think we ought to see how maybe the cross and the resurrection kind of change things? Don't you think that's important? Not if you're a Calvinist, okay? Left hemisphere. They see things in slices. They don't understand context. They can't zoom out, okay? John 12, 32. If you look who's drawing in John 6, 44, except the Father which sent me draw him, John 6, 44, look who's doing the drawing after Christ is lifted up. John 12, 32, and if I, if I be lifted up, I will draw all men from me. Thanks to Pamela C. for the super chat. I appreciate that. It says, I will draw all men to me. Who's doing the drawing? Jesus, after the cross. Who do they draw? All men. Any questions? See how clear that is? It's so clear. There's nothing confusing about that. There's no tension. There's no mystery. It is clear as clear could be. You couldn't make it any clearer if you stayed up all night with a clearing machine. All right? Ephesians chapter 1, verse 4. Remember, we're dealing with the idea of just keep reading. In Ephesians 1, verse 4, According as he hath chosen us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. Well, guess what? If you keep reading, you find out in Ephesians 2, 12, that at that time, ye were without Christ being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God. And if you look at Romans chapter 16, verse 7, Paul talks about his kinspeople who were in Christ before he was. Okay, So we may take some more time to look at Ephesians 1 and 4 a little later on. But if you just keep reading, by the way, when I was in the debate with Sonny Hernandez, he did not see Ephesians 2, 12 coming. It's been right there in the Bible. It's been in English for over 400 years. It's been in the Bible for uh, almost 2,000 years. Right there in front of him, he did not see it coming. It's like, it's like I pull out a new verse on him that he had never seen before. And since he's a Calvinist, that's probably the case. Calvinists know the passages that deal with... They know the passages that deal with their doctrines and support their doctrines. And they're as cognitive bias. They're blind to the rest of the Bible. Like I said, there are, there are no verses that, that actually say Calvinist doctrine. There are only verses that if you presume Calvinist doctrine before looking at the text, if you presume it, they seem to not contradict it. That's the best it has going for it. But there are multiple passages that very flatly uh, contradict Calvinism. Very easy, very, very easily contradict uh, Calvinism. Okay, So you have to presume Calvinism in order to think first before going to Scripture 
before you would ever think that any of the verses support Calvinism. Before I was introduced to Calvinism, I, you can't see this right now because of the setup that I have behind me, but behind me on the shelf I have, a, I have an Awana Excellence Award. I memorized the Bible for two years, and I memorized lots of scripture, memorized all the Calvinist proof texts when I was in third and fourth grade. And I never, I never had a Calvinist thought in my head. That didn't happen until later, until somebody started showing me Calvinism. These verses, none of these verses have to show. People say, people send me verses all the time. They're like, how do you explain this? I'm like, explain what? I, I don't see the Calvinism in that. And they have to tell me, oh, oh, there it is. Okay. Romans 9.18. What if you just keep reading? Um, Romans 9.18. Therefore he hath mercy on whom he will have mercy, and whom he will he hardeneth. And they act like that means that God's withholding mercy from somebody today, today. But if you keep reading, what, you, what do you find? Okay, ask the question, ask the hermeneutical question, the observation question. Romans 9, 18, therefore he hath mercy on whom he will have mercy and whom he will he hardeneth. Ask the question, on whom does God have mercy? Is the answer there? No. What if you keep reading? And, and this is another something Calvinists might not know. Calvinists might not know that Romans keeps going after chapter 9. It does. I really, I promise you, I promise you, there are seven more chapters in the book of Romans after chapter 9. And in the 11th chapter, that's just two chapters later, if you ask the, Herman, the observation question, on who does God have mercy? On whom does God have mercy? It's right there in Romans 11.32. For God hath concluded them all in unbelief that he might have mercy upon all. Bam. That's simple. There's no tension. There's no mystery. There's no problem. It's just simple. You see? People say, there's this tension between sovereignty and free will. No, there's tension between you and your ability to read. Okay? You don't need any of that stuff. You don't need to think about free will or sovereignty or any of that. You just need to read the text. If you just keep reading the text, you'd be surprised how much will just show up. There it is right there in the text. Calvinists like to bring up John 17, 9 all the time. I pray for them. I pray not for the world. And they just stop right there. See, Jesus didn't pray for the world. And it's like, look, buddy, what's, what's your problem? Why can't you keep reading the rest of the chapter? I pray not for the world, but for them which thou hast given me, for they are thine. In John 17, 20 through 21, we find out that Jesus had been praying for just the apostles, the given. Take that back to John 6, 37. The given, which were the apostles, of course, except for Judas. Okay, Kind of bad to have somebody who's chosen and elect... I've not chosen, you've not chosen me, but I have chosen you. Chosen and elect, and guess what? Going to hell. Yeah, that's how it works. By the way, Israel, in Romans eleven thirty two, Israel is called the election and the enemy of the gospel in the same chapter right there in Romans chapter 11, verse 28. Look that up. I didn't write that. I'm not making it up. <clears throat> So he says, neither pray I for these alone. Who, who are these alone? The apostles that were given to him, but for them also which shall believe on me through their word. Well, that sounds like the people in the book of Acts, okay? Which were lost at the time. That they may be one as thou, Father, art in me and I in thee, that they may also be one in us, that the world may believe that thou hast sent me. So in John 17, 21, does Jesus pray for the world. Yes, he does. Does he do it in John 17, 9? No. Does he do it in John 17? So is, is 17, 9 about salvation? No. Is John 17, 21 about salvation? It's about believing. It's about believing. You see how sly that is? What, so it's, I mean, it's really, what is it in a Calvinist? that causes them to single out verse 9 but not go to 21. Are they really ignorant of it? Or are they willing to deceive you, hoping you don't happen to know about it? What's really going on there? I'm not even sure. I'm not even sure. 